We're going to be talking today about The Mom Test, which is a book by Rob Fitzpatrick about how to interview your customers in a way that doesn't allow them to lie to you. One of the biggest problems with any sort of creative venture is that people will try to protect your feelings. You will say things that are overly optimistic, and when rubber meets the road and money tries to leave the wallets, people don't actually commit. They don't buy, and that leads to disappointment. But this book shows you how to get at the truth of that sentiment behind your creative idea and say, is this actually a good idea or not? And the reason why it's called the mom test is that if you do it correctly, you're going to be able to do it in a way that your mom can't even lie to you. So let's go ahead and take a look. I've prepared some notes and we're going to try to make this quick so you can get in and out with the valuable information that you need. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into it. This is the book right here. It's available on Amazon. You can see that it's also momtestbook.com. Uh, Rob Fitzpatrick, boom, uh, plenty of stuff. There's a Udemy course, even a little email thing. But what you guys really care about and what I wanted to be talking about today is going to be this little summary of the mom test. So I'm just going to be running through these notes really quick, and I think that we're going to get something great. I'm going to zoom in so you guys can read it with me, and I'm going to switch sides over here. That should be good. Yes, I like that. And... Uh, we'll also make that full screen for right now. All right. So first things first, how do you conduct a user interview? Well, you're going to want to do three things. First of all, you're going to want to ask questions about their life, not about your idea. You're going to also want to address, uh, ask about past specifics, not general hypotheticals. And you're going to want to just shut up as much as possible. And uh, this is a tip that they didn't mention in the book, but this is one that I personally like, is to count to four in your head before you speak. Even if you have something that you want to say, if you can try to do that uh, after they finish a long monologue before you jump in, that gives them the time. Maybe they want to expand on something a little bit more of their thinking. So let's go ahead and I can't believe I just made it full screen and we're switching over here. I wanted to show you an example conversation. This is one that I made up. He's got several in the book, but I think this right here is something that I like. It is an idea for uh, a photo app. That's So let's take this as an example. You have an idea for a photo app that uh, coaches you how to take better pictures by using an AI pose recognition and Google image search to show you poses of models holding similar poses so you can direct your people to do that or you might be able to get some inspiration as far as backgrounds and stuff like that. Possibly a good idea, but we don't really know yet. So now what we need to do is we need to actually go and interview someone. We need to interview a customer and there's nothing wrong with saying your mom if you do it in the right way. The way they start in the book is with the bad conversation. But let's go ahead and start with a good conversation, and then I'll show you the bad conversation as a juxtaposition. So, a good conversation. Hey, mom. And so, let's so imagine that you're going and you're going to be talking to your mom and interviewing her about this. So, a good conversation would sound like this. Hey, mom, when was the last time that you updated your profile picture? She says, oh, I don't know. It's been like a year or so. Why? Oh, I was just thinking about updating mine. I was curious if you remembered where you took your photo. Uh, it was on the boat. Uh, it was my birthday trip with your dad. You know, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then you're saying, well, who took the photo? You, what I want you to be paying attention to is that we are getting the conversation on topic, on the general idea for life, and we're just asking specific questions to get her thinking about that. We aren't actually asking about our idea yet. And so we're just asking, how does she view photos in general? How does she view X problem? So we're asking, oh, who took the photo? Because we're going to try to get onto how does she take photos right now? Oh, we just handed the camera to some guy and he snapped one. I thought it looked really good, so I posted it. Now we kind of want to think more about the professional photos. And so we say, have you ever gotten professional photos taken? Uh, so a few things that we noticed from that is that most people don't go out and get photos of themselves taken. And very often when they do, they don't plan them. It's just kind of dumb luck. That's how most people go about taking photos in the life. Very few people will actually go out and do professional photo shoots. Uh, so we ask, have you ever gotten professional, professional photos taken? And, you know, after thinking about that, maybe that would have been a better place to start. Maybe you should start here next time. But either way, we are listening to it. We're doing great. Now, of course, uh, the mom says, of course, we used to get family portraits on all the time as a kid. Ever gone out with just your friends to snap some portraits? No, I don't think so. I mean, my mom and my friends sometimes will snap pictures. I'll get some of them. Uh, is that what you're looking for? Uh, so the key idea here that we got is that she only takes photos when she's out with her friends. So if we're launching the app, we need to be able to handle group photos. That's probably an important feature. 
And we're also going to need to make sure that it's easy uh, to use and that it can work probably when you're out and about on a mobile data plan. You can't really be in the studio working on a Wi-Fi to download a bunch of high quality images or have like a live data stream. So handling that upload of images is another important process. So then we say, no, I was thinking I gained some professional shots. You remember how the uh, got you to look so good in the studio? Oh, no, I just kind of sit there and pose. I never really thought about it before. You just give me some instructions and, you know, I said, and some of them look good. I usually order a pack or two. And what do you normally do to make your, and then we might finish the conversation with going, what do you do to uh, make your own photos look good? And she's saying, well, I don't know. I guess I just smile and look at the camera. And from that, you might say, oh, that's a good conversation, but we got a bunch of bad results that said, oh, mom's not really our target customer, but we learned some truthful information that she didn't lie to us about. She's not saying, oh, this is a good idea. Instead, we learned that she doesn't actually really plan out her photos. She doesn't really do that. So she would not be a good customer for this because what's more than likely is gonna happen is she's gonna download the app and then she's is just gonna sit there on her phone for a year and she's gonna forget about it just using her standard iPhone app to take that unless we got a really good solution. She might abstractly say that she wants better photos, but she's done actually demonstrated any behavior that encourages her to do so. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the bad conversation. This is how most conversations work, at least for me, and I feel like for most people, before they actually um, consider like why is it a bad conversation. So, hey mom, I have an idea. I, can you, I talk to you about it? Sure, honey. Just by starting with that, that's bad. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So, you know, I really hate my profile picture, and I feel awkward trying to take those shots. I feel like it could be a lot better. Do you ever feel the same? Yeah, I, you know, I guess I don't really know what to do with my hands. So I thought, why not create an app that helps direct you to take better photos by showing you models that look like your photo? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I think that could be really useful. I bet it would help me get a better profile picture. Yeah, I think so too. Do you think $15 would be too much for it? Well, I guess when you compare it to like a professional photographer, they charge like $100 for a single shoot. In comparison, that seems like it's a really good value. Yeah, yeah, I thought so too. I, I, I think I know how to build it, but it's going to take a lot of time to get there. Can I show you an early version of the app in like a month or two? Sure, honey. <laughs> so, a few things there is that just by telling her that we had an idea, it automatically activates what uh, Rob, Fitz, Rob Fitzpatrick calls the pathos problem, which is that people are going to naturally want to protect your feelings when you tell them that you've got an idea. People don't want to you know, make you cry, make you feel bad, damage your ego. They want to keep things amicable. And uh, this right here, we're saying, yeah, we're kind of baiting her into the problems. Do you ever feel the same right there? And like, what is she gonna say? No, I've never felt awkward in a photo before. <laughs> Most people have. But the question is, do they do anything about that? Is that a big problem or do they just deal with it? Uh, so, and then it's like, then what we do is we just say, do we think $15 would be too much for it? And I'm saying, well, yeah, sure. It's in comparison to a professional photographer, but there's also the thing of like, well, it's an app and like, would she pay $15 for it? She might abstractly say sure that she would, but likely not because if she hasn't paid, if, if she hardly ever pays $100 for professional shots, she's unlikely to pay $15 for a camera app when she can use your iPhone. And that's what it's in comparison to, the free iPhone app. So first conversation we learned that our mom doesn't really care about getting great photos or she might, but she isn't actually trying to solve her problem. It says she just snaps simple photos with her friends and never really investigates how to get a better shot. That's the key thing. She's not taking any physical actions to do that. So she's probably just gonna be using that standard camera and if she was to download the app, she just let it sit on the phone. The second conversation gives us that false positive because it says, well, she likes the idea, she supports it. She says $15 is a good thing. And if I can make $15 from you know, her and I could just do that you know, a few thousand times, well, that's you know, $30,000 from 2,000 sales. If you, apps get millions of downloads. Oh my God, I'm gonna be swimming in cash, right? Well, not quite. So that is the difference between a good user interview and a bad user interview. In a good one, we asked about their lives, not about their our idea. We talked about past specifics, like when was the last time you got your professional photos taken, not about generics or hypotheticals of going, would you use this app? And then we tried to shut up as much as possible and count to four before speaking, which maybe didn't come across in my narration, but you guys get the idea. So 
here's some good questions. Why does this matter to you? How do you solve this problem currently? When was the last time that you did X? And walk me through how you currently solve this problem. Another good one that comes from how to talk to users from Y Combinator, we talked about this last week, was what is something that you, what don't you love about your current solution? That's a, another good one. Investigating again specifics and looking for those X. Bad questions. Would you buy this for X dollars? Do you like this idea? Any sort of hypothetical. Is this a really important thing? How much uh, do you think? Would you love this? Uh, what features do you think? Which one of these four features do you think is the most important one? All these hypotheticals and most of those are seem really good on the surface, like you're getting good solid data. But the thing is that you are going off of people's optimistic future selves rather than their past realistic selves. And that leads to you getting false positives and lies to your face. Not, not malice lies, but lies nonetheless. So if nothing else, take it this way. Avoid talking about your idea as much as possible. You want to hold off and try not to mention at all. Instead, you want to talk about their life related to the problem that your idea solves. So the other thing is that when you go into the conversation, it's natural to get a few things. You might get, you might get compliments, you also might get feature requests, and you also might get fluff. Fluff is just generics and saying, oh, I guess that always happens. Yeah, that never really happens, whatever the statement is. So if you hear a compliment, this is something that you want to say thank you to, that is a red flag and you're going to want to deflect that and get it back to specifics. That's saying that you're talking about your idea rather than about their life. Unless they're saying thank you for being such a good listener. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> if you get a feature request, you're always going to get feature requests. Users are feature hungry. I hear this all the time on everything. It's like, oh, we'll do this, going to add this. You don't want to ignore those. You want to write them down, but you don't want to just leave it at that. Instead, you want to actually dig into why they want that feature. Uh, the example that they gave in the book, which I think is probably the best one, is that uh, one of the companies that Rob worked for, the author worked for, was building this expensive analytics dashboard for MTV, when what they really just wanted was a simple report that said how many people watched their thing that they could email to their entire team to say, hey, we're doing good, guys. That's all. They didn't want a complicated analytics dashboard that took three months to build, and that's what the team built. Instead, they just wanted something that said, you know what? We're doing okay. And if you and if they had dug in and said, why do you want this? When MTV comes to them saying, hey, can we get an analytics dashboard? You said, why do you want the analytics dashboard? And they say, oh, to generate reports. You could have just said, okay, great, and then built that report generator right there in a tenth of the time that it took. So digging into feature requests maybe allows you to find a easier solution that would solve the problem in a better way. And then if you get generic answers, fluffy answers like, oh yeah, I guess I never really do that or I never really think about that, or yeah, that sometimes happens to me, then you want to try to dig into the specifics of when was the last time that happened to you. Same if you hear any sort of powerful emotions, try to get some sort of story out of them and uh, Talk about like why that's frustrating to them. Those are really important things. You don't want you want to dig into it. Don't you? you don't just want to move on. Uh, so the other thing that you're going to want to do is to push for commitments for right here. So you want to try to get realistic commitments as a measure of how serious you actually are. Commitments can doesn't just have to be them buying something. It can be any small sort of reputation that they put on the line or any time that they invest in it. And that could be if it's a B2B business, it could be saying, oh, yeah, let me introduce you to this other person. If they aren't willing to do that, then that's probably not a good sign that they really care about this problem. Another uh, thing that is important is that you go into the meeting knowing what you want to get figured out. You want to be asking questions. Ideally, you have got a top three in mind, top three learning goals, and you're asking specific questions around those. But you want to be careful when you ask those specific questions and say that, you don't want to zoom in too quickly on somebody who doesn't actually have that problem. This is something that I took away, and it's probably my favorite part of this book, is that if you, uh, or the biggest thing I learned is that I'm working on building a fitness app, and their example was uh, if they're talking to somebody whose life priority is just not even thinking about working out, you shouldn't be asking them, why don't you work out? You shouldn't be asking them, or what's the biggest problem with you working out? Because if that's the case, and you try to say, oh, 
why don't you work out? Well, it's inconvenient. They're going to invent a reason. It's But the fact is they don't care about it in the first place, and they're never going to buy your solution. So you shouldn't be digging into them because they're not really committed. It's not a life priority. Instead, you should start out broad, say, what are your priorities in life? Or uh, something like, or how do you view fitness? Or how important is this to you? How much commitment do you have around this? And then dig into the specifics of saying, oh, tell me about the last time this happened, stuff like that, before you don't don't zoom in too fast to a specific topic if they aren't qualified so the other thing is that you're going to probably have a lot of customers this is a common problem in startups and you want to segment that because you could ask the those top three questions to a bunch of different groups you could ask it to uh like let's take athletes as an example you have you know your people who are showing up day one at the gym never done a uh, push up before in their life and then you've got you know Olympic Usain Bolt athletes over here and you've got all the spectrum in between along with probably like specialty athletes of saying like you know maybe special Olympics and then you also have people who are just like physically active don't really consider themselves athletes maybe people doing like chair yoga all this other stuff that you could possibly do P people in PT. There's a million different segments along that line, and if you don't break that audience up into smaller segments and you try to please everyone, then you're gonna end up pleasing no one. You need to please someone before you start, uh, before you start trying to just add features on. So, the way that you do this is you're going to ask yourself in this broad group, what are the different sub sections? What are their motivations? And an important thing is, do all of them have the same motivation? You want to try to group people by that motivation because you're solving a problem. You own the problem, the, oh, I'm sorry, the own the problem, you own the solution, okay? And you wanna to try to find people with that problem and figure out how to target them. That's another important feature. You've got the same motivation and the go to similar locations. If you can't find those people, then that means it's not specific enough and you gotta start over again, try to break it up into smaller groups until you get to that, I know how to target them level. And if you have multiple groups, then you have to figure out which one of them would be the most profitable to start with and you try to solve their problems first. For me and my startup, I wanna solve specifically intermediate athletes, people who have been working out and take their training pretty seriously, but have kind of plateaued after the beginner gains and aren't quite ready to take it to the next level. For me, I know that they take it seriously, they have money to commit because they've probably been paying for a gym membership for a while, and I find that personally rewarding because they've gotten those great results and they wanna learn more about it. So uh, important questions, this is another thing that they talk about, is that a question is important only if you get an unexpected answer and it would change the direction of your company. Next, you're also going to keep it casual, or at least as casual as possible. These should not be formal interviews, or at least try to minimize the formality of them. Uh, you want to, because if you have uh, formality, then you're adding all this overhead and mental burden to it. It takes a five-minute conversation into a four-hour planning fi fiesta with you driving across, having to get coffee, all that other stuff, blah, 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 blah. You just want to try to be able to have your three questions on hand for each type of customer segment and then say, oh, you're this type of customer, let me ask this question. Now, if you do reach out, this is his advice. Few, uh, I'm sorry, very few wizards properly ask for help. So what that means is that you're going to share the vision, then you're going to share uh, your framing or, of like where you are in the problem, and then you're going to talk about your uh, weakness. You're going to show some sort of weakness to say, oh, I need help. And then you're going to put them on a pedestal, say, I need help. Or you can help me with that. And then you're going to ask for that help. You don't want to ask for a meeting. You don't want, because uh, meetings tend to be boring or like a big formal commitment. You also don't want to ask for their opinion because that's just basically begging them to lie to you about it, hey, protect my feelings there. And you definitely don't want to just be saying, hey, let's uh, chat or can I interview you? It's going way too. It's going way too in that time wasting formality range where they're going to shut down. Instead, we want to just say really quick, "What's the vision?" I uh, let's take uh, what I'm doing as an example. Vision: I'm uh, working on a fitness app to help people work out. I'm currently developing it, and I'm looking for. Uh, I'm looking to help understand how people currently go about finding their workouts. I know how I find my workouts, but I also have a degree and a huge level of experience. I want to see how a beginner approaches that problem and uh, or somebody less experienced approaches that problem. And I know that you have been trained for a while, but uh, you haven't done that same degree. And I feel like it would be a useful thing to talk about. Uh, could you help me out? 
Simple as that. Now, that I could send that out to uh, Reddit. I could send that out to a bunch of different places. And the rejection that I get don't matter. All I need is just one or two leads. And then from there, I can start asking, do you know anyone else? Are there any questions they didn't ask? All these other things that say, oh, you know what? Uh, that one person can turn into five others because they have friends who are at a similar level around there, or they might know their grandparent or whatever it is, but turning one cold lead into warm leads. You wanna to try to get away from cold leads as fast as possible and try to do warm lead, warm lead, warm lead by asking people to refer you and trying to start groups and join organizations and contribute to those and establish some sort of authority in the space. Next, you're also going to want to take notes. This is probably the uh, last uh, but most important part is that taking notes is important. Uh, you don't wanna just do these interviews and learn nothing from them. The important part is that you actively incorporate this and update your beliefs because if you are discovering that, oh, these user interviews, I'm just going through the motions, I feel like it's important and I'm not really getting anything out of it, then chances are you aren't doing them correctly. There should be something that you are asking important questions as we already talked about. And you want to be learning those goals. Reviewing your notes is just as important. And the way that uh, he says you should review it is that you should review it with your team so everyone is privy to the information. You don't want to have it, all of it in your head. And you want to make sure that uh, you talk about key quotes, not just you know general takeaways, but you want to get uh, the key quotes, the general takeaways. And then you also want to talk about that meta system saying, how are these user interviews going? How can we improve it? What questions can we ask? What are our learning goals around that? So the process is continuing to improve and get better. So let's go ahead and summarize this up with this. How do you prep for your next user interview? Well, first you just want to answer the question, what do you want to learn from this person? It's really as simple as that. And then if you want to go a little bit further, you have some more time, you're going to say, what are the top three questions that you want to ask? And what do you suspect their answers will be? Now, these three questions, if you get an unexpected answer, we want to see that our business direction would change. So something like going, what if you're, let's take the workout product, for example. If I was to say, as a question, do you like to work out? I would, I, I think that that would probably be a good framing question, but it wouldn't necessarily be groundbreaking. If that was my top three questions, it wouldn't be it. But a better question would probably be something along the lines of, why do you work out? I think that that might be a good one. Or why do you even, what's the hardest part about working out? Those might be good ones because if I got an unexpected answer and said, oh, the hardest part of working out is uh, going to bed on time or something like that. Or the hardest part of working out is getting my shoes on in the morning. Uh, because I just, I know if I put the shoes on, then I can't get out the door. So it's going, okay, that's an extra answer. So it's going for even earlier commitments and going, okay, they're even dreading going to that. So how can we make the whole experience more fun? That might change the direction of the business, as you can see. And then uh, if it's appropriate and there's some sort of commitment, like let's say that I've got an MVP, could I have somebody, hey, test that out and then talk to me in a week, something like that. That takes their time. And, um, or maybe I go for like a little pre-sale if I have some premium features. All of those would be examples of commitments. And then finally, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this, which is answering these questions for your business. Because in the book, and I recommend it for primarily business owners, but uh, the have some nice questions that help you evaluate, oh, is your business on the right track? Are these customer interviews helping? You're talking about who are your customers? Uh, so what are those different segments you can break it into? How do you find each segment? Which one of them are your most passionate and profitable customers? You need to have not just that uh, passion there, but also the ability to pay you because if you can't get paid, it's not a business, it's a hobby. Uh, what would be a sample of a good conversation? This actually was really helpful for me to do this example conversation right here with this app, uh, a photo app. I, it thought through a lot, just me going through and trying to anticipate what their answers were. That helped me a ton. I'm saying like, I got to think through all of this stuff and I realized, oh, you know what? Uh, I'll, people are going to probably be pretty uh, passive and it's likely that somebody's just gonna download the phone and no one else is gonna show up. Whereas uh, like maybe a professional would be a better person to target after this and then I should probably go out and interview them, such. But having that, going through and writing a sample of a good and a bad conversation really helps nail these lessons home and just by following the rules of saying, don't mention your idea, talk about their customer specific life and try to um, 
not just shut up as possible. Uh, try to talk about specifics as much as possible, not just about general. So saying, when was the last time this happened? Uh, that really helps uh, get out good information, even if you're just doing a hypothetical information in your head, hypothetical conversation in your head. Now, the last one was uh, that if the company fails, what would have most likely killed it? And if the, what would have to be true about the company for it to be a huge success? This is important because one of the things is that businesses don't just rely on one assumption. They rely on many different assumptions being true. And you're basically putting together a hypothesis and then you are testing that. And you're saying, if it's true, I'm gonna make a lot of money. If it's false, then I wasted a lot of time and energy. And that's the risk reward payoff that you're going. But thinking through what's most likely to have killed it. Uh, for my company, as an example, what's most likely to have killed it? Well, people don't wanna work out, right? Or people, I, I'm targeting people who just don't care about it, or they're happy enough with their current solutions. Those would probably be things that would kill it. Whereas what would have to be true is probably that the, I have got a really good user workout database or something like that. I've got really passionate, committed users and that this fits in easily to their life as some examples. But those right there are the key takeaways that I got from me in the mom test. I recommend you check it out. If you're a startup founder, I think that this is one of those books that you wish that you had read sooner. There are uh, links in the description below and this has been Get Skill. This has been the review of the mom test and as always, Thanks for getting better.